Hello and welcome to the second lecture of this week. In the last lecture, we ended up by uh, seeing that the electrons uh, were represented by probability waves and that they were abstract objects. These aren't objects that you could really measure, but you can only measure their mod squared um, mod squared values. So we'll delve a little bit more into what ab these abstract objects are. These are really abstract mathematical objects. Uh, we will also see why we need them and why they're absolute essential um, and why they're actually a very convenient way of representing the system. It might seem very ad hoc, it might seem very complicated, but it's really not. It actually um, uh, it simplifies the representation quite a bit. So we all know about numbers. We have used numbers, various things in our lives. Uh, we also know about variables. We have um, done algebra in school and in college. Um, but probably, maybe, um, quite a few of you are not familiar with these abstract objects. So they're not they're not tangible. You can't say that. Uh, you you can obviously say there are two apples. You can say let there be x number of apples, but with these abstract objects you cannot say anything like that anything that you can connect with in 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 your daily life so these abstract objects are well they're so, somewhat special uh, you are you will be required to imagine a lot of things okay um, we'll we, we'll get we'll get to see um, quite a few things which which are almost impossible to grasp without uh, imagining them and we will really not look at theorems we'll not look at theorems or axioms we'll try to familiarize ourselves as much as we can just by examples so we do more examples we how uh, we, we, we build our intuition about these uh, abstract objects and we go about our job like that so the first abstract object that you might uh, find is the wave function psi itself. So the wave function psi, uh, and we've discussed this in the last lecture, so the wave function psi is really an abstract object, it's a probability wave, and you can't measure it. So let's get a little bit more into these things. So abstract objects, um, these objects, okay, they're, they're these mathematical objects, they're something, okay, it's like a box, you can imagine them to be a box and it contains some information about a system okay so a system um, might have different types of information so there might be a certain object which has a particular type of information about the system okay um, so this kind of an object is called a ket 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 and it it contains a lot of information but just by looking at a cat, you can't quite say that it has certain number of information, certain amount of information. Okay, you need to do something to the cat in order to get some information. This is a lot like what you do in computer science. Um, for example, you go to an ATM, and this is one of my favorite analogies. You go to an ATM, and you know that the ATM uh, machine has a lot of money. But of course, you can't get the money unless and until you have an ATM card. So you have an ATM card and you do something to that ATM machine. Um, you insert your ATM card and you punch in your PIN number and then you can get some amount of money out. So the ATM card is like an object. It knows quite a bit about the m system of money that is there in that place. But uh, you can only get the information about your particular account. You can only get some amount of money out of uh, the machine by punching in the correct key and by uh, inserting the correct ATM card. So um, th that's that's like a computer program. The computer program just takes in a few inputs and it and it computes something and gives out a certain answer. How it does it, you don't know. Uh, the function might do a lot more, but it'll just. I mean what the function does really depends on the output so um, so the function is like a black box so an abstract object is also like a black somewhat like a black box you can um, get m much more information out of the system but you have to do it in particular ways uh, let's just do something more concrete uh, so these objects these cats they live in a certain space and the cats that we will be concerned about 
the kids which are relevant to quantum mechanics they live in a space called the Hilbert space we'll come to Hilbert spaces in the next lecture not right now what do we mean by living in a space? So living in a space means they live in a certain location and they abide by the rules of that location it's, it's actually extremely simple for uh, example if a certain cat lives in a certain space uh, where everything is red then the cat has to describe something which is red okay that's like a very loose example but that, that'll do for the time being okay so um, this is this is a place where the cats stay and along with the cats there are these things called operators okay there are these operators and the operators operate on the cats okay so um, these spaces this spaces which contain the cats also has a dual space and the space uh, so every space has a dual space and the dual space is just as big as this space it contains the same number of objects it contains actually it contains more number of objects um, but that's that's more mathematical statement to make and these are called these the space uh, the cats in those space those are not called cats those are called dual cats or they're called bras so we have the bra cat notation over here but so pictorially and I'll uh, leave it up to you to come up with your own imaginative way to uh, understand this uh, I, I, I won't push my own pictorial analogy but just for starters to get you started um, I will um, I'll, I'll introduce a certain picture which might be useful so the cats are denoted by this kind of a symbol okay you have uh, a fence an A and it's, it's just enclosed on that so this is a symbol for a cat this is a symbol for a bra which is the dual of the cat called the dual cat so this is called a cat a this is called a dual cat a so the name of the cat is a is whatever is inside it okay it's very simple um, so say this is your space and the cats live in this space so the cats can be called a b you can name them as cat this is cat a this is cat b you can name them um, it can be denoted by numbers so cat 1 cat 2 it can even be denoted by symbols like plus and minus it can be denoted by uh, certain numbers like E L so a set of numbers can denote E L it can be denoted by Greek letters like psi and phi and it can be denoted by a series of phi's as well phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4 or a series of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 okay. these are all valid representations of a cat this is just how you name a cat it has nothing to do with anything so uh, what I'm trying to say is that you can uh, choose to name your cat such that it means something to you this is exactly like what you do for a function name of the function really doesn't matter but you generally choose a name for the function such that you can identify that function later on and of course there is this dual space where all the bras stay so the bras are just uh, the cats reversed okay, it's as if it's mirror reflected among, uh, around this line and you have this kind of uh, system Okay, now no, don't for even once think that this space is smaller than this space. It's not. It's not smaller. Uh, the size is not. Uh, it's 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 it. This space might actually be bigger. The size is not represented like this. So just make the meet this up so that you get familiar with the idea. So now you have all of these cats in a space. Okay, and now you need to get some information out of them. Now, this cat, the psi, is a special cat. It has all the information about a system. It has all the information about a system. That's that. That is something we'll be using time and time and time again later on. But for now, just say that it has all the information about a system. Um, so you take that cat, okay, and you need to pry the information open one by one. So you take the cat and hit it with this dual cat X. Okay, so you hit it with the dual cat X, and it, this is this notation is very simple. So you have a cat X. Forget about this one. You have a cat psi, and you hit it with the dual of X. Okay, and then you, what you get is the psi of X. The psi of X we know already. This is the good old V function. The psi of X was the probability amplitude. This is the good old V function. Okay, so 
so if if our system was say a one particle if we were dis dis we were describing a particle okay and it was described by this cat of cat psi okay then the value of that cat at the position x this is in the position space is psi of x so the wave function is in the position space this thing the psi of x this quantity is an abstract quantity but it lives in the position space this lives in the Hilbert space and you overlap that with x so that you find the overlap of this in the position space it's, it's a pretty neat trick so you have psi which is an abstract object and it has a lot of information about the system and you hit it with the dual x and you immediately get a psi of x and this is the thing which lives which is our familiar v function and this lives in the position space and if you mod square it it gives you the probability density okay you mod square this it really doesn't mean much it, it, it will in some time not right now but this one we're familiar with similarly we can we can um, instead of x we can consider five we can consider p which is the momentum so we can say that if you hit this not with an x but with p then p on psi which is the power of p on the ket of psi is some different function it's not the same function psi so it's a different function 5p okay this is the wave function in the momentum space so this is the wave function in the position space uh, this is the wave function tells you the probability amplitude of the particle being at position x this tells you the probability of a particle having a momentum p so if you mod square this you will get the probability density of a particle having momentum p okay so this information this object is pretty cool you hit it with x you get psi of x you hit it with p you get a 5p which is a different function of psi of x and these two are wave functions but they live in two different spaces so this lives in the position space this is this has x okay and this lives in the momentum space and we are going to constantly use uh, x and uh, p which is the momentum and position to be our dynamic variables the dynamical variables will uh, for a long time now will be just x and p which is pretty neat uh, that you can describe a lot of the whole system with these two um, dynamical variables that's it's pretty neat and now it might so happen that if you have a ket psi and another ket xi okay this is psi this is xi if you have a ket psi and a ket xi and you take the bra of xi which is the dual ket and hit it on psi and you get a zero if this is zero okay then these two cats are orthogonal that means there is no overlap between psi and xi between the cats psi and xi okay this is an overlap so if this wave function is zero there's a zero probability of the wave function being at the position x so it's zero everywhere so here if it's zero there is no overlap between these two cats so they're like completely independent of each other okay one cannot possibly depend on the other nothing there's no overlap between these two okay so this is one trick we've learned if you have this kind of uh, an object we can hit it with x or p and we get a certain amount of information about the system okay so now we need to consider something more we need to consider operators so let's operate so the operators are like the apparatus which you ask questions from the system it's it's, it's like an experiment but done on paper so mm, uh, so in, in an experiment often you measure the voltage or the current so that's like asking uh, asking a certain question to the system and the system responds and you measure the response of the system so this is like the risk measuring the response of the system so these operators act on the cats so these cats are also called states so these operators act on these states I mean if they represent a state then only then is it called a state so cats are not really states but they're close now generally what happens is that if a ke if an operator acts on a cat this is an operator this is a simple thing so it's capital A is the operator if an operator acts on a cat psi it changes the cat psi to a cat phi it's as simple as that 
it changes the cat size to cat5 okay and it gives you a certain number a okay we won't bother about the number a um, because the state is changed so it generally what happens is the state is changed the psi and phi are not the same and the psi and phi are not the ones that we discussed in the last slide uh, so the psi and phi are two different functions two different cats so one cat can go into another via a certain operator now this is not a very interesting or a very useful solution once in a while what happens is that this operator hits a certain uh, state psi or rather xi and that xi is unchanged okay this is an interesting case the xi is and this is a special case obviously but this is an interesting case so xi is unchanged and it leaves behind us this small number a okay this number okay this is small a so a is this capital a is for the operator small a is for the number this is a number this is in general a complex number and that this kind of thing is interesting because these xi's are now called eigenstates or eigenkets okay we will come to exactly why this is important in the next lecture where we will discuss a little bit about the hydrogen atom and how to uh, characterize the hydrogen atom in this kind of a language so we state an, an eigenstate uh, so the, 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 this state is an eigenstate this thing and this small a is the, I call the eigenvalue so this is just eigenstates and eigenvalue so this is the eigenstate and eigenvalue this is just German names now this is really a measurement this, this is a measurement because the state does not change. If the state changes, you don't know what you're measuring. Whether you're measuring on this state or with, whether you're measuring on this state. It doesn't really make any sense. But if you have this kind of a thing, you know that the state doesn't change and you're really making a measurement. Okay, the operator A acts on the state and it remains as it is and thereby you make a measurement. Eigenvalues are the values of this measurement. So you get a measurement, you make a measurement and you extract number and that number is an eigenvalue okay so if you have a state with energy e say this state xi if you ask it what is your energy it will tell you my energy is capital e if that be the case then that is equivalent to saying there is an operator which is called the hamiltonian h and you operate h on xi and it gives you this h so this operator hamiltonian which is H. H is the operator which can extract the energy. There are these various operators which can extract various things. So this operator which is, which is named the Hamiltonian, it can extract the value of energy. So it, this, oper this on the left hand side is basically a question which is asked to the state xi. What is your energy? And on the right hand side is the answer. My energy is E. Remember the state cannot change. The state has not changed. So xi is an eigenvalue of the operator, the uh, eigenstate of the operator h, and e is the eigenvalue of xi. Okay. So uh, we have had a really heavy week. This one, there's lots of new con concepts, and we will jump into real particle physics in a couple of lectures, and that is why we are running at this pace. Uh, so in this. Um, we created the Feynman thought experiment. We used bullets, we used lights, and we used electrons. And we got to know what probability amplitudes are and what probability densities are. And uh, in the second part, we did a little bit of quantum mechanical formalism. It's by no means complete. It just introduced you, introduced you to a little bit of formalism. We discussed what gets are, what, in what spaces they live, what operators, what eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And we will see the importance of eigenvalues and eigenvectors in the next lecture, the next week. And the next week, uh, we'll also have some variations on the Feynman thought experiment. Uh, so we'll also have a little bit more on the formalism. We'll develop the formalism a little bit more. We said that we need new language. And this is the language that we're developing. So please ask questions, because this is not simple. This is pretty non-intuitive, pretty non-trivial. Have a great week. Hope to see you in the next one. Thank you.